Good morning, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer, and I hope you're doing very well today. Welcome to another Grim gameplay, this one featuring what is, in my view, one of the very coolest archetypes in modern Rakdos Shadow, featuring Scourge of the Skyclaves, and also, unlike maybe a time or two I've played it in the past on the channel, featuring Bomat Courier. In the past, I've had Soulscar Mage, for example, in this slot. Bomat Courier has since become stock, and it is very clear to see why. Unlike Soulscar, this creepy crawly little robot, it's got haste, and that's huge. You know, chipping in on turn one is going to enable turn two Scourge of the Skyclaves. It just goes right along the plan with what the deck's trying to do. And now Soulscar Mage is a strong card too, but Bomat Courier may be a little bit more synergistic just because that turn one haste is so, so crucial, and because... Soulscar is a great enabler for red-based removal, but here in a black-red deck, one that is ar arguably base black, predominantly black, we don't really need to whittle things down as much with Soulscar. We can simply kill them with Fatal Push and other black-based removal spells. So, so uh, Bomat Courier's Haste may be more relevant, Soulscar's, uh, its competitor's, other ability less relevant. On top of that, Bomat Courier can refuel your hand like crazy. This card will draw you often 3-4 cards after chipping in for 3-4 points of damage. I tell you what is not to like about this skittering little machine. And um, talk about a machine. The deck as a whole is very clean, very strong, very interactive, but also very aggressive and streamlined. And it even has big grinding potential. No surprise that it is one of the top format decks, even before the bans, frankly, but in the wake of the bans as well. This grim gameplay is brought to us by Confidant Tier Patreon supporter Lame Boy. This is Lame Boy's list. We'll go through a quick deck tech. And this these games are played on behalf of you, Lame Boy. Uh, one of my favorite Patreon and Discord members. The uh, the memes from Lame Boy in the Discord, they're second to none. They're hard to beat. We've got a couple other good memers in the channel, but Lame Boy is right up there with the best. And not just a meme lord, right? A great uh, player with lots of good insight as well. So thank you for your support, my friend. And thank you also to Joseph Guyman for being another confidant. You are a brand new confidant, my friend, and I welcome you to the fold. And the other patron we have to thank today is Mark Andre Kurasinski, who has been one of the OGs, one of the most generous supporters over time. And Mark stayed as a supporter despite not playing Magic for quite some time, but he's back with a vengeance to jump them out now that the bans have taken place, and he's back up to the Of the Veil tier. You do love to see it. So thanks to one and all patrons. Let's talk a little bit here about Lame Boy's list before we jump into some games. All right, so of course this is a Lurus companion list, therefore the permanents are staying at the two drop or less um, mana value, right? Not CMC, mana value. Never going to get used to that. But um, so that's just the first thing to note. But then working left to right, 19 lands, including two canopy lands, a full 10 fetch lands, and a full four shock lands. If you haven't noticed, we really want to aggressively fetch and shock for a variety of reasons. Turning on Shadow, turning on Scourge, uh, we're able to scry quite a lot, pseudo scry of Mishra's Bauble. We're also able to fill up the graveyard for Croak's a Titan of Death's Hunger. There are so many reasons to play a mana base that looks just like this one. And of course, the two canopy lands speak for themselves, Flood Insurance, uh, digging toward crucial interaction at crucial points, and filling up the graveyard for Kroxa if you're really flooded, also damaging yourself for the black threats. And three basic lands, some beautiful options here from Odyssey, because you can't leave home without basics, and we've got three. So 19 lands all day, four copies of Mishra's Bauble, and then look at this beautiful low-curve Rakdos interaction. Three Fatal Push, two Inquisition, Four Thoughtseize, because we prefer to damage ourselves, or lose life in this case, all else being equal. Four copies of Lightning Bolt, still just as good as ever, and obviously enabler in a couple different ways, and can help uh, finish the opponent off when we're on an aggressive plan. And two copies of Dismember, which just like the Canopy Lands, the Fetch Lands, the Lightning Bolts, the Thought Seizes, it both interacts with the opponent and progresses our game plan. This deck is just such a well-oiled machine. The threats are four Swifty, four Bomat Courier, four Shadow, four Scourge, and the on-field general, Kroxa, Titan of Death's Hunger, as a one-of, as the most value-positive permanent we have, besides maybe an unchecked Bomat Courier. 
At the top end, we have two copies of Teamer Battle Rage to help break through board stalls and jump blockers and to race combo decks and so on and so forth. We have a copy of Coligan's Command, which we can find a lot of good use cases for. It's kind of like a supercharged lightning bolt, if you want to think about it that way. It's obviously more flexible, but you know, they're both flexible. They can both go upstairs and they're both instant speed. Coligan's Command, of course, buying back threats, doubling down on the attrition that our black cards already bring to bear. Lots and lots to like, as any Jun player will tell you. And then two copies of a delightful piece of technology, Knight's Whisper. You draw two cards and you lose two life. Very, very cool. Only way it could be cooler maybe is if it was Sign in Blood, so you could finish the opponent off with it. But maybe it's just a little bit too hard for double black Sign in Blood to, you know, you could probably cast it most of the time, but it's not free when you have a Mountain and a Sunbait Canyon in the deck. And uh, for just for those times where you either couldn't cast it or or you maybe couldn't double spell with Sign and Blood into another black spell, maybe that's why people play Knight's Whisper. But note that Sign and Blood could also be used to finish off the opponent, otherwise an identical, if slightly harder to cast card. That is the main deck in the sideboard. We've got three copies of Soul Guide Lantern, which I hate because Nile Spellbomb exists. However, I know why people play Soul Guide Lantern. The fact that it's not as good at doing both at the same time as Nile Spellbomb is mitigated because there will be times you can loop it with Luris and you're winning whether you're looping Spellbomb or Lantern against those relevant matchups. Um, and I understand why people play Lantern. I'm not saying it's wrong in this deck, but my mid-range instincts say Spellbomb all the way, all day. But this is not quite a mid-range deck. It's something different. So we got three Lantern, two Kozal Let's return to uh, break the um, symmetry in a really big way against go wide weenie decks and especially to kill Oriac Champion and other hateful cards. Three copies of Cleansing Wildfire. This is our good interaction against Big Mana, against MDFC combo decks to the extent that we still see those. It's aggressive because um, we're drawing cards, we're churning through our deck. It's relatively low cost. We're getting prowess triggers, on and on and on. What a good card here. Uh, fourth Fatal Push in the side. Love to see that right now. A Feed the Swarm. This is an out to Ley Line of Sanctity. It's also just helping to achieve critical mass of creature removal. And just like Knight's Whisper and everything else we've pointed this out about, the life loss is generally a feature and not a bug. We got a second Kroxa for when we need to grind and when we need to have a critical mass of discard, whether or not it's targeted, right? Uh, two copies of Vangrath's Rampage. This is a really good flexible card. It has impressed me a fair amount in the past few months. Um, notably, it is vulnerable to Leyline and the presence of Rampage along other all the other um, things we've mentioned as far as our black-based interaction goes. Just more incentive to play that Feed the Swarm. And finally, a second Coligan's Command. Also a good grindy tool and obviously live. Whenever Shock can kill a creature, you're two for one by controlling the board. That is a great place to be. So this is Lame Boy's list. Thank you so much, Lame Boy, once again. Let's hop right into some games, see how we do with Rakdo Shadow today. All right, we have kept against an opponent mulling to five, playing a Scalding Tarn and saying go. Obviously, that's a pretty good start for us. Uh, I'm going to, I guess, just do the uh, bobble thing to maximally inform my Inquisition. If we were more even on resources, I might hold something or... Um, okay, there's just a Lightning Bolt and a Force of Negation. I'm going to take the Bolt. I might have sequenced differently, including using the bobble to scry with my own um, fetch land versus basic land draw, but we're pretty far ahead, so I'm just going to really figure out exactly what it is they're doing. And a snapcaster mage is coming off the top. We don't want snap bolt coming down the pipeline. And Thoughtseize is going to be able to take care of snappy, or maybe they'll flash it in. <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry, they shuffled it away. I was like, wait a minute, what am I talking about? Yeah, haven't quite woken up yet, my friends. Sorry about that. Let's go ahead and get our life total nice and low. Both players, admittedly, even though we're pretty far ahead on cards, have only lands right now. Opponent's got a Field of Ruin that can basic check us. We have two of our three uh, basics in our 60 already with us. So that could be an issue over the course of the game. 
Got a shadow. Cool. <clears throat> Let's not forget about our Lurus either. There's actually some scope to fetching and shocking main phase in case they've got something for our Bomat, but I really just don't think they do. Would we really pitch all, like, three lands for two new cards? Yeah, you know, we, we definitely would. But given the prospect of Lurus, I'm just simply not going to do that. So sure enough, <clears throat> Bomat goes down. We're going to Faction Shock again, put Lurus into hand, then we've got plenty to do. No worries, no worries. They would have Helix Star or Bomat. Maybe in response to the Shadow coming down. Again, that could have been interesting, but whatever. Well, I'm going to fetch and shock as aggressively as possible here, because we are just simply drawing way too many lands for our own good. But let the record state, you don't always want to be quite so cavalier with your life total against a bolt snap bolt deck. I think I'm just supposed to buy back Bobble and then play Shadow if Luris resolves, which I'm not sure it will. All right, let's fill a load of black. Remand. A nice one for OP. <clears throat> but here's a shadow. Alright, OP's two cards, at least one of which is a land. We got another shadow. Seems good. Seems really good. Let's try to grow the shadow before damage. <clears throat> Monoleek, okay. Not quite, but another shadow we hope will finish the job here. Because we don't have anything else, so uh, sweeper... It's the scariest thing for OP to have, obviously, but that's just the game. Good enough for me. So against Jeskai Control, uh, Kroxa seems good. Coligan's Command, maybe like a Soul Guide Lantern. I'm going to cut my Fatal Pushes until further notice and probably just run it like this with scope to alter things a little bit based on what we see. Maybe a single Dismember for another Soul Guide Lantern. That looks about right to me. I think I'm into the keep. I would love discard and a uh, slightly lower land count, slightly higher spell count, but I think keeping this is fine. Uh, we've, as always, got the companion, which is going to be nice against a deck like this. We've got a good proactive aggressive hand. There's no chance they've got Blood Moon in against us, right? I'm not going to... If I thought they might, I would lead on Blood Crypt. And then have the fetch in the back pocket to get a basic swamp if it was shaping up that way. But that's not what's going on, right? Croaks is a good draw here. Croaks is really going to break the symmetry here with them wanting to be an interactive deck and, you know... Find good places to trade one for one, start trading two for two. Lurus already breaks that symmetry pretty well as the free eighth card. Kroxa definitely going to help us do that. It's some of the beef that we needed. Um, run in six, interesting. All right, I, maybe I just played too quickly and I didn't see forest, but we are looking at more of a pile than I initially thought, and that is okay. Um, that makes Kroxa a lot worse. I would love to be able to kill the Ren. Ren also makes our Bowmat Courier pretty bad. 
So I think we're probably just supposed to cast a Knight's Whisper here, which is pretty cool. I don't know if I've ever done this quite before. We get Prowess this way, we get to Sculpt our Hand. And we get to decide whether we're ignoring the Ren or not. We have another Whisper and a Blood Crypt. I think we're supposed to ignore the Ren. Alright, uh, our hand is, is shaping up in a way that is interesting. Croxus can still be really good at just escaping. <clears throat> Mishra's Bauble. Happy enough to lead on that. Let's immediately bobble them for info. About to draw a colonnade, okay. Let's just go for another Knight's Whisper here. Inquisition. <clears throat> Pretty nice. I think I'm supposed to do that rather than cast a shadow, because one thing I'm really curious about is a Supreme Verdict or the like. An Inquisition can't take it, but it will let us know about it. And we can also see exactly what their hand looks like. Uh, they have double path to exile. Well, that's not. Uh, so a verdict at all. So, yeah, tempting to chunk around here, but still just going to ignore it. There's the path. And now next turn we can unleash this horde in our hand. We now have double Scourge of the Skyclaves too. Probably supposed to deploy just three threats here and make them sweeper or bust. They pick a Misty Rainforest back up. Well, look at that. We even can bobble to see what the top of their deck yields. Another snow-covered island. Well, my friends, it's time. It's time to go ham. All right, OP. <laughs> I don't expect you can beat this, but you can try. Oh, man. We draw another Scourge, too. That's pretty exciting. And that's the match. Wow. That is exactly what Shadow intends to do. I've uh, granted the opponent flooded like crazy here, but we had the interaction. We had the clock. Oh boy, that was a really good one. Not going to lie, that felt pretty strong. A nice keep, you have to say. All the threats. All the aggro threats, the one drop, etc., etc. I wonder if there's any scope to... Um, leading on Swifty into Bobble rather than Thought Seizing. Because Thought Seizer is, is our only piece of interaction, we're still probably supposed to just Thought Seize T1. And then go... Um, I'm going to save my Bobble, though, for a double Swifty into Bobble next turn. Cryptic Command, Jason Mind Sculptor, Path to Exile. Hmm. Um, you know, getting a single threat path isn't the end of the world, so I actually might take... Uh, I'm going to take Cryptic Command here, but I, I still think taking Path would be pretty good. Difficult to make a wrong choice there. We hope that with a double Swifty progression, the Jace is not much of an issue, just like it wouldn't be against like a, a Black Red Prowess deck, which is kind of how our opening hand is shaping up, right? Certainly fetching shocking as aggressively as possible here, leaving our basics in the deck, you know, the drill against control. OP fetching. It looks like there looks like we're gonna get a path out of them, which I think is a good outcome. No? Okay, stand corrected. We'll just go get another hallowed fountain. And we get to smack him for four. Uh 
oh, they've got a verdict. Good to know about. Bad for us, but that just means we hold our shadow, right? But verdict, definitely a problem. Able to protect Jace. Let's just draw Thoughtseize. We're going to see a couple this turn. We draw Verdant Catacombs, Lightning Bolt. Not the very greatest. I think we're just probably putting Lurus into hand, unfortunately. Although, uh, we swing... Let's say we bolt them. Let's say they... Well, I mean, they have a path. We're just simply not going to kill them through that path before it's verdict time, so yeah. Lurus into hand. Okay, they just go for a path right on beginning of combat. Fair enough. I guess everybody knew it was happening, right? Okay, so their hand, I believe, only contains one unknown. We draw Thoughtseize. Well, let's find out for sure, am I right? Definitely a great draw here. Ooh, they'll respond with a path. Even better. I mean, I get it, but... Yep, well, we're just going to try to beat this Jace with a Lightning Bolt. So, Verdict is what we'll take. Luris is who we'll play. Bobble is what we'll buy back. I think we're going to save the Bobble until after their Jace activates. And hopefully Luris can just run away with this game here. We'll let this resolve, I guess, before we go for the bolt. We could also consider just like untapping and killing Jace, right? Okay, let's look at the top of their deck, I guess. Monoleak? Okay, so I don't know how important it is to be efficient here with our mana. I don't, I don't think very. So I'm going to fetch and shock just because I think playing it loose with our life total is correct, but otherwise I'm going to hold my bolt. If we draw like some really aggressive stuff, we could come to regret that, but ultimately I think it's fine. I'm still really unused to playing Shadow going down to five. It feels a little incorrect even in the face of this. Um, Blue-white control matchup where it's about as free as it gets to do so, but... I guess we're gaining the life back here, which probably ultimately is not a good thing. So, I mean... <sighs> There's some tension here. The shadows get worse with Luris. Scourge makes sense to hold because of the kicker. I think I'm going to play a, a single Scourge, though, and force the opponent to beat this. I, I just like don't want to throw my lead away to them to, like blindly top-decking another verdict. That's not even blind. They had a little bit of selection involved. Um, we can beat Monolakes pretty well from here on out. 
All right, let's bobble with the knowledge that they could fetch what we're about to see away. Hopefully they don't, because it's a glacial fortress. I doubt they need that for anything shy of snap. Verdict, and we've drawn Swamp. So let's just keep looping Bobble, or it's looking really OP. So we would have had the kicker here, which is definitely something. Well, let's see how well we do here. Snapcaster Mage. Okay, so they're in a path. <clears throat> Scourge. We're going to bolt this thing. Happy we saved it. They probably still have to path Scourge given the hugeness of it, but the more value positive thing, of course, is to path Luris. But yeah, they got to gotta take care of Scourge. No lands to find. Yep, that's right. Ooh, maybe I could have bobbled myself and then decided whether or not to fetch. That would have been pretty cool. So that Glacial Fortress is not there. I'm going to main phase a single bobble. Okay, Glacial Fortress is there. Got it. Um, <clears throat> do we even play another Shadow? I don't think so, because Luris and Shadow are a little bit awkward. So we'll just make them answer the cat, if they can. And they can't, because it's only Fortress and Monolith. Got it. Um... So yeah, let's draw another card. They're about to draw Narset. That's a scary one. So our deck not aggroing as well as it could, but grinding like a champion. And just all of the baubles. Literal all of the baubles. Might as well Inquisition that monoleak out of there, but frankly, we don't even need to do that. All right, so play a bobble. Bobble myself. Decide whether or not to shuffle using this Verdant Catacombs. Bomac Courier. These cards are all lining up a little bit weird against Narset. Um, part of me wants to draw any creature, right? But... But, uh, ooh, I don't know what to do there, guys. I guess we're going to draw the courier. I guess that's fine. I'm definitely starting to feel as though I could have sequenced differently here. Um, in order to not be in this kind of weird situation. But at the same time, I think we followed the cues of our hand well enough. And there is just this unfortunate Luris Shadow non-bow. Um, we did get punished with them top decking a snap after we had run out. Can't draw more than one card each turn, so we can bobble this turn. Notably, we won't want to bobble on our own turns until we can take care of her. She finds a cryptic command. All right, once again, I'll bobble myself, even though the info from them would be useful. And Swifty. I'll draw Swifty. I'll just draw a bunch of threats that I have haste. That seems really fine to me. In fact, it seems so fine that the opponent is just dead. Because we can get prowess off of the bobble, and after a bit of a grind... We do get there. All right. So hard to go wrong against a control deck when you're looping bobbles with Luris. Again, it felt a little bit weird in places there, but I think it was ultimately pretty much correct. Um, I don't probably want to do too terribly much here besides cut my fatal pushes and like a dismember or two. So let's begin by with the idea of cutting them all. You could cut TBRs too, so 
Um, even though I don't think Soul Guide Lantern's that necessary, we can bring it in. Did okay, Command, frankly. And, uh, well, and Graf's Rampage, we probably want both to beat Planeswalkers, sure. So I'll leave the Dismembers out. We'll play with about two Soul Guide Lantern. I think this is about where we want to be. All right, this is a really nice one land keep. I got no issues keeping a one lander like this against blue white control. Obviously, drawing the second land would be ideal, and look at that, never didn't have it. So, having drawn the second land, I think I'm going to get aggressive. I think we want Swifty into Bobble here to kick things off. I think I'm following the cues of my hand with this rather than inquisitioning right away, which would also be. Perfectly acceptable. But we saw that early pressure translated into kind of forcing paths out of the opponent's hand, which kind of translated into Dolores running away with the game last game. Something similar could absolutely happen here. All right, another Swifty. Good enough for me. We're going to go on the double Swifty into Inquisition plan. A close cousin to what we did in game one, which was Inquisition into double Swifty into Bobble, right? You tend to think of Swift Spear as more of a supporting card in a deck like this, but they've looked awesome this match. Are we getting pathed again? Opt and timely reinforcements got to be a timely, right? Pretty easy take of timely. And then they have a bunch of lands and chase. Opt one to the bottom. Do I have an extra card in their hand? Jace, Opt, Delta, Field, Flooded, Strand. The Hallowed Fountain's already on the field. So two unknowns in OP's hand, and we draw Inquisition. Let's go. Seems great, right? And putting Luris into hand is fine. Inquisition could whiff, so maybe it's not even as great as we're thinking. Hmm. Let's actually consider this. Going wide in the face of Jace makes a ton of sense, but we don't strictly have to. We have Bolt, we have Courier to pressure, we have Rampage to answer. So maybe we're supposed to put Luris into hand. See what happens here. Obviously, the pre-combat Inquisition is ideal. Beginning of combat, they will fetch. Is it Snap Opt? Archmage's Charm. Oof. That's a rough one. All right. Guess we are kind of bolting our own Swifty here. Kind of have to, right? Yeah, that's a rough one, though. Not going to lie. So unfortunately, we do get time walked pretty badly. I don't really think I'm supposed to Inquisition here. Um, but you know what I am going to do is play the Bomat Courier post-combat, I guess. You know, if we walk into a verdict, we walk into a verdict. I believe this to be correct overall. We could always then decide to cash in these two cards for one fresh one, although that's probably not the best. Yeah, it's a Jace. Off of the Delta. I'm thinking after the Jace brainstorm resolves, the Inquisition will be good. 
it'll it'll be at least likelier to hit. Let's put it that way. It'll also give us full info on how to sequence with our Bomat courier. Let's faction shock on the end step. Shadow. All right. Once again, we're committing to not putting Luris into hand, which is rough, but I believe Inquisition's got to be correct here. Path to Exile, Timely Reinforcements, Cryptic Command. A lot to hate. A lot to hate. But once again, taking the Timely makes the most sense. And then we can attack Jace off the field and play a Shadow. It's only going to be a 1-1, but that's definitely a thing. We could also Rampage Jace away and get more aggressive against their life total. But I think we're going to play the Shadow here. This does not look like the type of game where we're going to more or less cleanly aggro them out. This was a scourge of the skyclaves. I'd be, uh, <laughs> I'd be guaranteeing that they will path it. As it is, um, you know they have, they can with relative impunity do the pathing path and the cryptic thing off a of field of ruin without having to shock. So it's not the best, but they're not. They're only holding up one or the other, and I guess it's clearly cryptic, right? We'll go to attack the Lecrypticus down. Which is why I wish we had Lurus in hand right now. The second main Lurus buyback bobble. Classic, classic line. But we'll at least still put him into hand. Her into hand. Bowen still might kind of be on verdict or bust, but they're delaying the game. I'm going to see a lot more cards this way. We're now in Snap Cryptic territory. There's no Verdict, though. There is a Soul Guide Lantern. Not playing that. We'll go to Attacks first, see what happens. Hmm. Okay. They're not going to do anything here. Could bolt ourselves to grow the shadow. I'm not going to do that. We're just going to be relatively disciplined with our spells. I will play a second main soul guide lantern. I think that's fine. The reason I didn't do anything main phase is because we wanted to be able to slam Luris if they were going to cryptic us down again. In response, they will path. Yes, I will use the ability. Of course. Of course I will use the ability. I guess I, I mean, I fear a lot of the cards in their deck, uh, or in their graveyard, rather. But let's hit Archmage's Charm. Possibly the highest ceiling and most versatile while also being just a, that little bit less clunky than Cryptic Command. It's not more versatile than Cryptic in a vacuum, but against our deck, the Steel... Steal your threat mode is mega, mega live. Okay, opponent still has a field of ruin in hand, so they are flooded a bit. All right, opponent, if we bolt, they're at four. They're still not dead. So I'm going to bolt. Uh, they're still not dead to our prowess, that is, if we attack. So I'm still going to bolt on the end step here. Um... Trying to clear out my hand for the purposes of Bomat Courier, I guess. Hmm. 
fascinating game. These last couple turns you could have sequenced a wide variety of different ways. There's no doubt about that. All right, we go for Lurus here. We're presenting a bunch of redraws in two different ways. If Lurus resolves and takes over, we'll do the bobble thing. Um, that's totally fine. If they had countered Lurus, then we have Bomat Courier in the back pocket for that. They're going, oh, they've been hanging on to a Celestial Purge. That does make some sense. Okay, fair enough. I'm going to hold up Soul Guide Lantern here rather than play a Shadow. They're gonna. They're going down to one. I don't have reason to think that much besides verdict is going to directly punish us, or directly keep them alive, and that would punish us for doing the shadow thing. Obviously, there's the field. What was their top deck? Nothing that keeps them alive. So a good mix of aggro and grinding power with plenty of interaction spiced in. That is exactly how these decks can get over the line against control. But Lurus, as the companion, pretty crucial to it in many, many circumstances, unless you're just kind of running them over with a ton of discard spells and some early threats. All right, got a ship and no lander, but it was looking like a really good one if we had even one land to keep it, and uh, this one we'll keep. I guess we're just going to bottom TBR. Again, mid-range bias most certainly kicking in, but Knight's Whisper's ability to unmulligan us and the broad functionality of this hand otherwise definitely feels fine to me to keep this, right? So the opponent going down to five, um, we probably, we interestingly kind of have more incentive, I guess, to go Swifty to kick it off, but at the same time, more incentive to Inquisition to really cripple them even further. Um, let's once again go with the mid-range plan of Inquisition U. Island and Sleight of Hand, Serum Visions, Electro Dominance, Crashing Footfalls. Oh, okay. Um, probably supposed to take one of the cantrips to give them a fail rate. And Serum Visions is the better long game cantrip, so we'll hope they break off sleight of hand, I guess. So we are against the Electro Dominance as foretold combo deck. Here comes a sleight of hand. Under many circumstances, you would want, of course, to take away either the payoff or the enabler for their combos, but with the Mull, and, Mull to 5 and the fact that they could be totally non-functional. I don't mind um, doing as we did, right? This was one of my fears with sequencing as we did, that we would draw something non-proactive, and now we have to kind of spend the turn just hitting with Swifty to turn on Scourge next turn. Um, fatal Push, not very good in the matchup, unless they, of course, manage to cast... Electro Dominance for Crashing Footfalls, and then it beats a Rhino cleanly enough. They'll exile, exile Greater Gargadon, one unknown in OP's hand. Okay, Verdant Catacombs. Giving us some options here. I think the most aggressive play is to just deploy our threats, kind of race them in a clunky style of way. I think we would have been probably more rewarded for turn one Swifty, turn two Knight's Whisper, turn three Inquisition, but that's kind of an irresponsible thing to do on the whole, right? All right, so are we going to see if footfalls we are? I see, I see. All right, so we miss out on a prowess trigger this way, but I am going to push for the sake of efficiency because we have so many things to do between putting Luris into hand and the Knight's Whisper and the top deck and everything else, and we draw a Dismember, which is great. That is just fantastic. What a draw. We're going all in, baby. Big dismember. 
Big swing. Couple of haste threats to maybe clean back up, as long as they don't. Now, I, I guess if they get to go off this turn, we probably would need to draw land off the top, and they're still all the way at nine. It's not like they're at one or two, right? But they brick. I guess they flooded out a little bit here. And that is the game. Only Electro Dominance remaining in hand. Nice. So against a deck like this, uh, Kroxa can be good. I think we're going to play Feed the Swarm to beat the Enchantment. Um, you know, Cleansing Wildfire, attacking a vulnerable mana base. I've heard worse ideas, but I'm probably not going to do it. Probably not really going to do much else here. So let's bring in these two cards, and we're going to cut... I think that we want to race, so let's cut a single push. And we'll race and disrupt, obviously. I don't hate the pushes because they beat Rhino, but what else to cut? Maybe a Knight's Whisper? Go a little faster on the draw? We'll try it. I don't know if that's correct, but sure. All right, a four-lander. A four-lander is not ideal. Nevertheless, I'll keep it. We've got some serious functionality here. Uh, three one-drops, two are which are very aggressive. One helps us rebuild. And a thought sees. We can, we can work with this, right? T1 Serum Visions. Without Simeon Spirit Guide in the format, there's not as much need to Thought Seize this turn. They're not going to power out a turn two, um, as foretold most likely, although admittedly I don't know how the list have adapted without that, you know, whether anybody would try like a Ritual into Monomorphos or something, but um, I think we're probably just supposed to get a Fetch Shock Swifty uh, turn going, and then next turn we can play Bowmat and Thoughtseize. Should be good times. We now have a Scourge, and we saw how well Scourge uh, turned the corner for us last time, right? So Next turn, assuming nothing crazy from OP, we're probably supposed to lead on Thoughtseize so we can cast it again if they remand. We got double prowess triggers that way, and also we actually resolve a discard spell which is uh, <laughs> really important. Opponent went top-bottom with the first Serum Visions, and then they will Sleight of Hand. Shock in a Stomping Ground. Lightning Bolt a Swifty. Fair enough. So now would be a good window to play a Scourge if all this had happened and we were on the play, although I guess it wouldn't be that way, right? Um, but again, with turn three coming up, I think the responsible thing is to Thought Seize here. Yeah, sure. Thought sees you. OP with five cards in hand. Force of Negation, Opt Serum Visions. Wow, nowhere near the combo. Once again, I'm just going to take away the card that really digs the best. Um, so as it happens, we would have been rewarded for just like playing the Scourge and daring them to have it. But <laughs> on average, I do definitely think it's correct to Thought Seize and Bowmat here. A little scary, though. We're kind of shields down now as far as our interaction goes. We're just trying to hope they brick for long enough for us to get over the line. With not the best clock we've ever seen. They top with that opt. And then they're fetching shocking passing. How interesting. And we are flooding. Got it. Right, let's go for a Scourge here. This might be a Remand. No? Okay, fair enough. Don't necessarily know what we're seeing. They obviously have a Force of Negation in hand. 
Is this like an is it charm or something? Oh, they got electro dominance and something to cast. Draw three. Seems good. All right, but have they found what they need? Because they could draw, like, lands permission, maybe just one half of the combo. They could still just be dead on board, um, you know, once we... Now, even without us losing any more life, they are dead on board. We see them go mountain into sleight of hand. We see them cast Serum Visions, okay. The more cantrips they have to cast, the better it gets for us. Have we just faded the combo? Well, we're about to find out, I guess. Well, it's, it's halfway tempting to cash in the bow mat here, but I'm not going to quite yet. Oof. The bricks are real. All right, let's see what they've got here. Okay. Oh, whoops. I'm just thinking they're dead, so I forgot to actually activate Bowmat, which was a punt. But I'm pretty sure they're just dead, so it doesn't matter. But I obviously played this horribly. Um, we could use that mana to cash in, but I'm not going to because I believe they're just dead. Okay. Scourge OP. So obviously I should have cashed in Bomat Courier there. We have just lands in hand, but no big deal. Getting there with a little bit of disruption, a decent clock, and maybe the inherent fail rate a little bit, at least here in game two of the deck. Maybe also in game one of the opponent's deck, right? Because they did take a mall to five looking for the combo. Anyway, we'll take it. Police in the blue decks today, my friends. Really, really nicely, you have to say. Well, those were some fun ones, my friends, if you ask me. And I now I'm recording this kind of outro, this wrap-up, this how do we beat this deck with mid-range section after the fact. I, of course, played more games because we were having so much fun, and the games are so quick on average. And granted, this is only the two-player queue and or the tournament practice lobby, but we're beating up on Eldrazi Tron and on regular Tron. We're beating elves, really strong elves progressions and really long grindy games. The list goes on. This deck just... Every Every time I pick it up, feels so powerful, and I'm not even, you know, any kind of expertise with it. Maybe I can leverage the mid-range tools relatively well, but overall, you know, Shadow is still not second nature to me, um, you know, but uh, the beauty of this Rakdos deck, right, is that it is relatively forgiving, and it does kind of combine elements of mid-range and of traditional older-fashioned Death Shadow decks and of Mono Red Prowess decks, right? So what a beautiful, beautiful deck. And uh, yeah, thanks to Lame Boy for some good times. Bomat Courier has been very, very impressive. And uh, we got to do a little bit of everything here. As I said, we were p policing the blue deck, so Luris coming in and out grinding them as the free eighth card that just loops them out of the game with baubles or with whatever else. Bomat Courier and Swifty, as mentioned, have been very important at kind of setting the tone of the game and being value positive in the case of Courier, being a really genuine threat in this deck, as she is in any deck that she has played in, in the form of Swifty. Shadow and Scourge obviously need no introduction. The old eight shadow plan definitely coming to fruition here for us. And then you've got so much interaction. There's just so much to like. So um, as always, we have fun playing this deck. But how do we play against it on mid-range? Well, here are some play patterns to keep in mind. Number one, let's talk about Luris. So generally speaking, against Luris, you are rewarded for keeping the graveyard clear in a value positive way. So Nile Spellbomb, for example, a pretty great card against this deck, especially when you start thinking of Croaks a Titan of Death's Hunger, Coligan's Command, other cards that it can kind of neuter. Spellbomb is your friend and Luris. Also, there is a bit of a dance that can be done against an opposing Luris if you want to hang on to a discard spell because you know at some point they'll be reaching for that Luris trying to put it in hand. That is definitely something you can do, but be careful. 
because you can also get caught waiting too long. And if they make land drop number six, maybe they put Lurus into hand, play it right away, get a bobble back. That's not ideal either. However, against this deck, you are often rewarded for that, kind of forcing them to make the first move, putting Lurus into hand, only for you to turn around next turn, Inquisition or Thought sees it away. One of the major reasons you can get away with that is because... In some grindy situations against a mid-range deck, this deck will often be left holding a team or battle rage in hand, especially game one. So it's not as though you necessarily have to go check the hand right away. This deck plays to the board, they play proactively. If they're holding cards in hand, it might be something like that, right? So you can definitely find spots where it makes a lot of sense to hold this card. Don't feel forced to just check their hand just for the sake of doing it, especially when Luris has not been put in yet. Another thing to keep in mind is the card Cling to Dust is very, very intriguing. Now, Cling can help beat Luris in the sense that it can take away the most prominent Luris target, especially good at hitting Mishra's bobble, right? Because then Kling gets to cantrip. You've taken away the bobble. They don't have that floor anymore for Luris unless they find another bobble, and then Kling provides X for one potential in the late game. However, Kling has other use cases, and let's pivot to talking about that specifically as it pertains to Scourge of the Skyclaves. Kling to Dust and other, you know, instant speed, preferably, Decent life gain one-shot effects are good ways to blow out Scourge to the point where you can actually kill it. You get your life total back up to 20 somehow, and you are going to kill any and all Scourges right on the spot. So to that end, um, a card like Scavenging Ooze is a great card in this matchup, but realistically speaking, the game is not going to be in a state where the Scourges are that small, and you have the luxury of gaining enough life with Scoos you know, all in one turn, basically, without it getting answered for you to kill Scourges with it. So we're looking at cards like Cling to Dust as almost the platonic ideal for what I'm talking about here. It's a life gain card, which is relevant in general. It has X for one potential, which is very relevant. You don't want to just play like a, a healing solve, for example, against this deck. And you also get the um, potential to just outright kill a Scourge of the Skyclaves or three would definitely be a really, really good feeling. Um, so Death Shadow, of course, against Shadow, you have to watch the opponent's life total. You have to watch how they're managing their life total. You have to be able to take as many cues as possible from that. But against Scourge, it's different because you're managing your own life total as well. The power of simply deploying a tapped Overgrown Tomb or Blood Crypt, for example, on turn one against this deck is actually kind of real because then you're kind of forcing them to have Swifty or Bomat Courier on their own turn one or perhaps to Lightning Bolt you upstairs on their turn one. Now, they're not exactly mulling aggressively toward these cards that die to all of your removal in this matchup and pointing a Lightning Bolt upstairs is ultimately something that they don't want to do. They are here to play a resource battle with you, the mid-range player. They cannot afford to use Lightning Bolt as a mere enabler most of the time. So if you can keep your own life total naturally at 20 for as long as possible, you might force them to make suboptimal plays and or you might force Scourge to rot in hand long enough for you to generate some really significant tempo. Keep in mind that they, as the Rakdos Shadow player, they're afraid of your mid-range attrition on a traditional mid-range deck, and therefore, again, they're not mulling aggressively toward perfect hand. Uh, sometimes they'll keep functional hands, and they won't have the perfect curve out, and you get to get some crucial tempo in the early turns. And that's actually... Very, very significant, because look, if this deck didn't have Luris, we'd outgrind them for days. If they didn't have the free 8th card that's always accessible and that itself can bury any opponent in value if unanswered, then we would outgrind this deck for days. But that's not the case. They've got the Luris. So while I do think your average Rock deck, your average Jun deck does have more X for 1 potential, overall does outgrind this deck on average, it's actually a relatively thin margin. And so to that end, you can't just say we're committing overall to the grindy plan, and if we have even a halfway functional early game, we're going to get there in the late game. That's not really true. The margins, as I say, are relatively thin, so you do need to take those tempo advantages where they come, because while your grinding power might be a little bit better than theirs on average, their tempo and their efficiency, 
ratings are much, much higher than those of the average mid-range deck. So to the extent that you can throw them off their tempo game, that is very, very nice. Now, the other thing, as we mentioned against any shadow deck, if you're a Rakdos mid-range player or a Jund mid-range player, and you've still got your lightning bolts in post side, which I think on average you should, um, specifically to kill these small threats, and also to kill, you know, early scourges and shadows that they feel priced into exposing. But don't forget the use case of keeping an eye on their life total. You can always cheese them out of the game if they get too aggressive with their life total. Five is a nice number to have in mind because that's a Coligan's Command Shock and a Lightning Bolt, you know, something like that. Or they are simply one untapped shock land away from the good old cheese them out with Bolt plan. It's happened before, it'll happen again. It could happen to you as a shadow player, and you could be the one doing it as a red mid-range player. So always, always keep the life totals foremost in your mind. They're not necessarily the axis on which the match is decided directly, but they are very much relevant. They, they color the texture of the game in such a way that you will see against like no other deck this side of burn and prowess, right? The life totals really are the gateways to a lot of what goes on, a lot of what this deck can and cannot do. So there's definitely that to consider. Um, obviously, you should be, as a mid-range player, just as willing to keep functional hands even if they're not perfect because this deck is going to thought seize you for days it's going to inquisition you for days it's going to have more discard effects like croak so coligan's command it's not unheard of for a deck to bring in liliana's of the veil out of the sideboard and move the Luris main deck as well and pivot to a more um almost traditional mid-range style play to, to keep pace with their opponents um, in these regards, and obviously they've got a lot of removal too, so take nothing for granted in this matchup. Um, against Mishra's Bobble, try to give them as little info as possible. W all else being equal, you know, if they bobble you for info and you can shuffle it away, maybe consider doing that. Um, you can kind of read the opponent for cues, and, and often they'll be, of course, bobbling themselves, as you may have seen us do here today, but you understand the point, right? And also track what the opponent knows about your hand, whether it be from their discard effects or from their bobble peaks at the top deck or any other way they could know info. You need to know what they know. You need to remember what they know and keep it in mind. Um, also be wary of combat tricks. Combat tricks can come in many forms. A dismember can be the biggest single blowout because it can not only shrink, even the biggest goyf can get shrunk into a chump blocker based on this dismember at the wrong time, or even worse, dismember can outright kill one of your things and grow their scourges, grow their shadows, and make the combat a total one-sided massacre in favor of the shadow player, right? Uh, to a lesser extent, Lightning Bolt can play this role, obviously, bolting uh, before damage upstairs to either player is live, as well as bolting the board. You have to give your opponent credit for these. You have to game it out. And ultimately, you have to be willing to call their bluff, too. So if you're behind enough that, you know, you have to block to stay alive, obviously you do that. But if you think it's a bluff attack, don't be afraid to call it out, because shadow players, in my experience, are way more likely to bluff attack than just about any other class of player. Of course, Teamer Battle Rage is another major combat trick. This one can swing combat with a double strike. It can be a nasty trick. Also, if you're a little bit careless with your math, it can simply end the game, right? So definitely got to keep that one in mind. Knight's Whisper is to some degree a high impact discard target simply because it is a guaranteed two for one that also as we say does enable them and um you know while while that might be the temptation ultimately all else being equal i do believe it to be correct to deal with their threats as they come up whether that be with discard or removal or both if they can't stick a threat they're not killing you. I know that's kind of a trite thing to say, but it is true. And the threats also are exponential. You know, the smaller one-drop threats enable the black threats, right? Um, so I think on average, on the long average, it is better to attack their threats with your interaction, even maybe over stuff like Knight's Whisper. Uh, something like Coligan's Command represents a different prospect, though, right? Because that is going to buy back the threat and do something else. So 
a high priority discard target. All of this also is contingent upon you having a plan to deal with the Lyris, whether you are, you know, hoping they get stuck on two lands, for example, trying to kill them before Lyris becomes a factor, or hanging on to that discard spell, uh, holding up a well timed Nile spell bomb. You gotta have a plan for Lyris if you're aggressively attacking their threats. And as always, with your interaction, you should identify the weak point. If they have a hand of like five threats and a thought seize, and you are on the play, discarding them before they get to discard you, you should probably take the Thoughtseize and force them to just run out threats blindly. Hope your deck can deal with them. If you have a well-balanced hand, you probably will. So otherwise, um, you know, you can respect their ability to bring in cards like Soul Guide Lantern against you. But, um, you know, generally speaking, if you're competitive, they can get punished for registering Lantern, whereas Spellbomb might be more of a free roll. You got to expect them to have all the removal spells in, right, and as much interaction as they can. So sideboard accordingly, Veil of Summer is very good against this deck, although there are situations in which it can be a little bit dead in hand. You can lose tempo against a deck that already beats you on tempo if you are holding up Veil, vale, hoping for them to play into it. That said, it's still such a blowout, I think you need it, and if it lines up, it's one of the most tempo-positive and value-positive things, for example, a green-black rock deck could do against a deck like this. So there you go. Any other questions on how to compete with Racto Shadow, please do leave them in the comments below. Until then, my friends, I will talk to you there, and I will see you for the next video. Thank you so much, Lame Boy, for bringing this back to the table. Your list fell awesome. I haven't really dropped any matches with it since I've been messing around with it. It feels right where we want to be. And uh, thank you, as always, for your ongoing support. Thank you as well to the patrons I mentioned at the beginning of the show. We have another new Inquisitor and an, in or, excuse me, another new Confidant and an OG Confidant going back up to Of the Veil. Vale. Very, very generous of you, my friends. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.